Hello, everybody. Hope you're doing marvelously well. I am sitting here with the wonderful Paul Tingham. How are you, my friend? Pretty good. What about you? I'm good. It's uh, it's one fourteen in the morning for me, which means it would be what ten fourteen for you. Are you nine hours it's, ahead of me. It's 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 by some definitions more rock and roll where you are than where I am in terms of time. Right. But I just spoke to a <laughs> professional last night who gets up at four o'clock in the morning and starts mixing at five in the morning. Who is also in Los Angeles. And that really blew my brain, I have to say. I, I kind of relate to that. I, I actually got up this morning, and this is what's so crazy. I suppose it is this morning now, but at 4.42. Mm -hmm. I, didn't we, we texted or something at about that time in the morning, and then we spoke at, what, 8, it, 8.30? It was early for you, it was, but you yeah. had a plumber in, you know, as, yeah, as one does usually in the morning. Yes, as one does. One has a plumber arrive at one's house. <laughs> the days don't start properly unless you have a plumber coming to fix something. Or, or, your, uh, or your tractor. Indeed, <laughs> that was my thing yesterday, yes. Get my ride on mower fixed, yes. Now, we know each other because... What was the name of the... What, is the, what was the name of the article that we did together? What was the official title for those articles? Uh, well, the series is for Sound on Sound magazine. It's called yeah. Inside Track. The secrets of the mix engineers, and it's interesting because the the song we're about we're going to talk about in a little while um, ended up being how the basically the same process that I went through, where I took a song that was mixed on a console and stemmed it out and then remixed it with stems and mm -hmm. just reading you know through that they they went to the same process, but anyway so tell me a little bit about yourself you're now in France. Yes, I live in France. You're obviously from the Netherlands, and then you went to England and Scotland. I lived in London for 10 years. I lived in the countryside around London for a bit. I lived in America for two years, around Los Angeles. I lived in Scotland for a few years, and now I'm in France. But I call myself an anglicized Dutchman. Uh, as I, as I, yes, as I, you know, I'm, I'm Dutch, uh, pretty Dutch, but I mean, I've done everything I do is in the English language. Right. And really focus around English music culture or Anglo-Saxon, really, you know, American, British. Uh, right. And so, yeah, and I'm a music journalist and a musician. Wonderful. And, and you an just, author. Yes, I think I author. showed you the, the book of Miles Davis. I am so, ex so excited to read that. And you were just showing me two minutes ago this very, very beautiful uh, Gibson acoustic sitting behind oh me. yes uh, well this usually stands next to me here as i pick it up and i get some ideas this is a it's a gibson they called it a jo when i wrote to gibson like 30 years ago when i bought it in amsterdam and it says it's a gibson jo from 1947 it's got the original as you maybe can see uh old 1940s headstock yeah beautiful yeah that that shape is gorgeous have you done um acoustic solo stuff then albums and uh yeah i done one album called may the road rise to meet you uh that i did about 20 years ago and i got some it's just mostly one acoustic guitar a couple of violins some treatments michael brook who worked with brian eno he uh he did a treatment and kind of helped me out a bit this was in the 90s a long time ago all still record was all record on that uh, just a very, very beautiful Sanken microphone that I bought of Metropolis uh, Studios in London. And then actually, because at the time, Pro Tools was kind of still early days, so we actually loaded onto, onto, onto analog tape, 16 track, because it was cheaper. And only later on, once the digital thing became the norm, <clears throat> did I realize actually it's a bit of, bit of, whoa, it kind of sings a little bit, because the tape machine wasn't totally stable in its speed so it's got this little bit of analog stuff in there but the, the music is inspired by a zen practice mind, mindfulness which now has become total mainstream but basically this album was 20 years ahead of its time and i got some kudos from john mclaughlin and martin taylor and some big guys and and then i wrote a book and then i got kids and that's why the second one has been kind of roaming around in my head and on the playing but still not recorded I, uh, that's fantastic. I, we we talked uh, the other day about uh, John McLaughlin, who's obviously a phenomenal musician. But you just brought up Martin Taylor. When I was a kid, I used to go to this folk club, and he would come through and play, and just come in and just play. And I remember there would be like twenty people in this little tiny back room, and there'd be this absolute incredible. It's those kind of experiences are just really a huge, 
just absolutely wonderful. I can so, imagine Martin Taylor is an amazing player, you know, just 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 astounding. And just the kind of player when you watch him, you say, okay, I give up. <laughs> and he's, he's so good that you, you kind of feel like, oh, me touching the guitar is an embarrassment if there are people that good, you know. But luckily, he's one of very few. So yeah. <laughs> the rest of us can still go around and happily make music. And in the end of the day, it's not about the technique, of course. It's about the ideas and the melody and the absolutely yeah. the, the, the aesthetics of the whole thing and the feeling. Yeah, the creativity. As I always say, creativity is king. It blows everything out of the window. I love that Tom Petty quote. I'm sure you know it very well. If I'd been a good guitar player, I would have been a terrible songwriter. <laughs> probably, probably. It's a different focus. Yeah. So, so you've got a musical background. I think you described to me the other day that you were a reluctant journalist. Yes. I thought that was, I thought that was kind of a... A, a interesting way of putting it. So how did you fall into journalism, journalism then? If you're a musician, how did you end up there? Oh, man. Uh, a long time ago, in the mid-80s, I was very young, and I was traveling, hitchhiking around America, and I was staying. It's, it's the most bizarre story ever, and I wonder, one day I think I'll write a book about it. But I was staying with a millionaire in his house, two swimming pools, who actually had taken upon him to... Uh, start a recycle center. This is like in the in Nevada City, which is uh, kind of in California, Grass Valley, Nevada City, on the way to Lake Tahoe. So he had taken it upon himself to start a recycle center and empty the dumpsters of his supermarkets and take everything recyclable. And, and living with him was an, as an amazing piano player. Who and I was staying with them for a bit. I'd been hitchhiking, just met the guy in San Francisco, got invited, and um, one day the piano player they met an attractive woman in a park tried to chat her up, and the husband came along, who was actually Roger Hudson. Oh, wow. Tramp fame. And so Roger uh, courteously invited the piano player over, and I got invited to Roger Hudson's house, and that was my very first encounter with this world of rock and roll, and people were very famous and very rich, and I was a super tramp fan at the time. Well, kind, yeah, yeah, I liked him. So I was like, wow. And then I went back to Holland uh, later on, did some really bizarre things. I won't go into all that. But anyway, basically, at some stage, I thought, well, I have to make a living. And I was playing clubs and doing things where it wasn't making a lot of money. So I, Roger had an album out, and I called him and said, do you want to do an interview? And some music technology magazine was just looking for writers, and that's one thing led to another. And two years later, or a year later, I got an interview with Sting. Uh, long story, very crazy that I got it, but I got it. I went to Paris to interview Sting about Dream of the Blue Turtles. Oh, I love that record. Oh, a great album, and Sting oh. was actually really, really cool, really good. Uh, it was a collective interview with some journalists who asked really psychophantic questions, like Sting, how come your songs are so great, and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> and I was the only one asking, just to my mind, normal questions. And he, I have to say to his credit, he answered only my questions and didn't bother with the kind of psychophantic and basically I sold managed to sell that article to a magazine called Electronic Musician and Music Maker that was in the UK at the time and they had to do tons of stuff to my English I'm sure and I had an English girlfriend so at the time the move to England was obvious and then one thing led to another and before long I was working for Sound on Sounds and lots of other music magazines, also in the US. That's kind of stopped because the US magazines have all been taken over by one publisher who won't pay very much. So most of my work now is for Sound and Sound, the monthly secret of the mix engineers, and that luckily for me sells to many other magazines in Germany, Japan, Australia, Poland, Holland. I translate the Dutch myself, the rest of the translations obviously are done by the magazines. But that's how I make a living. And in between I've been gigging and doing stuff but i think howard jones once said if you have a plan b if you you know then you end up often doing the plan b but I'm, I'm actually also at peace with it it's great you know it's also great to do the job and meet people and meet all the greats and talk to them and it's it's been wonderful and of course i think i mentioned my two i have two kids 11 and 14 and they're beat makers they make music so they're like feel like they're walking in paradise because just the other day they were talking to zed you know they're great EDM musician. I was interviewing yeah. him. So they were sitting either side here and they're talking with Zed, you know, and they want to be EDM musicians. So they're like... That's amazing. Yeah, they're like, ah, oh, they just can't believe, you know, and when they tell these things that the, to, this, to their friends at school, they literally won't believe them. They literally don't believe them. So they're a bit mm -hmm. like... <laughs> <laughs> so they're, you know, 
in the end of the day, it's making the best, you know, the, making work what you do and what you have. But I still play and still gig and I wrote the book and so on and so on. Now, the Miles Davis book is an interesting story because you said to me, you're not really a jazz fan. And I'm like, well, how did you end up writing such an amazing book on Miles Davis? The long story is on my website, as I probably mentioned, miles-beyond.com. But the, the, the short story is that I, I've never particularly liked jazz. Actually, the funny, I have to make one aside to that. I really like jazz musicians and the jazz yeah. culture. When I lived in Amsterdam, I went to jazz clubs often because I liked the intelligence Mm -hmm. And I liked the, 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 the people were not, you know, they were really, I found very friendly and very open and very intelligent and in, interested in many, many things. And at the time, it's better now, at the time, the world of rock and roll, and I played in some rock bands, it was a lot of like drinking beer and, and smoking joints and no interest outside of music. At least it was that, like that in Amsterdam. Uh, and... So I didn't have a particular affinity with jazz music as such, but I liked also the, the adventure stuff. But I was very much into prog rock, and I was in King Crimson, and weird rock, like Henry Cow. And, and Henry Cow? To, wow. Oh, yes, I listened to Henry Cow. And just anything that Can. was weird. Yes, I listened to Can. They were a bit too straight ahead rhythmically for me, although I like, I know Holger Chuke, the bass player, and he's a, yeah. that's a whole story apart. But um, Mother Updoff. <laughs> yeah, he's just weird guys, very German. Yeah. But basically, I once heard on the radio heard a track that was just amazing. And I later found out when I did the research, it was, was John McLaughlin on electric guitar. It was from uh, Live Evil. And I went to look to the, and in these days, as you did, you went to the local library and they had loads of records, you know, these vinyl things. Was, and then I found, it's right here, I'll show it to you. So I found this, which is uh, Agartha by Miles Davis, an album he made in 1975. Amazing. And I thought, this is not possible. This guy is as old as my father. And, you know, in those days, you know, people over 30 were hopelessly uncool and out of touch with everything. My father thought the Beatles were way too ahead of their time. And <laughs> I listened to it. It was the most insanely bizarre, weird, weird psychedelic funk I'd ever heard. And actually, if you look on the inside, it's really beautifully designed. There's a picture of Miles Davis, and I found out he was 50 at the time he made it, or 49. And I thought, what is this guy? He doesn't look like that. And how can anybody of that age make that kind of music? This is impossible. So, and there was no documentation, nothing about it whatsoever. And many years later, I did um, a music degree at the University of London. And I decided to do it about Miles Davis, about this album. And then I found out there was no information whatsoever about this music and about these people. You know, Pete Cozy on guitar, after Jimi Hendrix at the time, probably the most advanced guitarist on the planet. Nothing. Uh, Michael Henderson, great, great bass player, nothing. Al Foster, a little bit because he's also known in the jazz world. You know, he had actually a, a fairly well-known saxophonist, Sonny Fortune, on this album. Actually, Reggie Lucas and Tume together, they later worked with Madonna. Um, and I, I realized there was absolutely nothing. And then I got the idea of writing a book about it. And then I approached his publisher in New York, uh, Watson Guptill and the imprint was Billboard Books, and then I spent the whole of 1999 and 2000 writing the book. I thought, I think one year out, it took me two and a half. Right. <laughs> it was really intense, but you know, if I show you, I don't know whether you can yep. see it on the camera, but if you see 300 pages of this, yeah, small print. Uh, it's a lot it, of work. It ran, it ran completely out of hand, but I talked to almost all the guys who work with Miles, and that was just... Um, it was just a great experience and, and the, the intelligence and the, the, they were all just so full of it. You know, he was such a musician who had such an incredible way of knowing about music. And actually, the, the interesting thing also was that many people, and the start was Marcus Miller, you know, who was a bass player in the early 80s. And Marcus, he became later very, he's one of the most well-known well jazz musicians and bassists on the planet. He kind of drew the parallel with was, was a Zen teacher because Miles had these kind of really, he would say, one thing, one line, and that it made you think. He didn't give much that many directions. Uh, and one fantastic story is from In a Silent Way, which was his one of his, you know, breakthrough albums into the, also the world of the hippies and rock and roll. And it had John McLaughlin on guitar. And this is in February 1967, and, and there was Tony Williams, a drummer, who had brought John McLaughlin over from England. And Miles got quite jealous, so he invited John McLaughlin on this session 
And at the time, you have to remember, today we have tons of guitar players who can play like, you know, 500 notes sure. a second. But John McLaughlin really was the first guitar player who could do this rapid fire, you know, uh, stuff where you pick every note, you don't, you know, like literally like people go like, it's impossible. And what was the instruction, Miles? He, he watched John McLaughlin for a few minutes playing and then he walked over to John McLaughlin and, and John McLaughlin said, yeah, this is what he said. He said, to, Miles said to John McLaughlin, play as if you don't know how to play the guitar. Later spoke to John McLaughlin and I said, well, John, sorry to say this, but don't get upset. But to my ears, you know, the music, the, the guitar playing you did with Miles actually, actually was the best of your career. And I thought he just got really annoyed and, but he just was silent for a moment and he said, yeah, you're right. So Miles uh, had this kind of Jack to Jeanette called it a vortex. It kind of, there was a, an awareness, a, a focus on the music, you know, and, and all of us, I think also, you know, people watching this who play live and, you know, you play, you play this song maybe 50 or 100 or 200 times before and, and there are times you were going through the motions, you know? I notice when I'm practicing, I may play a guitar, and it's like you're driving a car, and suddenly you're 10 or 100 kilometers further up, and you can't remember what you're doing in between. You're gone on automatic pilot. And I think the same for musicians. To actually keep playing these things, really being fully awake in the present moment, is actually quite a job. And this is what Miles, he would hear, the moment people were in autopilot, he would get it. And one favorite uh, occupation he had at the time, he had also had a keyboard, the Yamaha keyboard, I think it was. And if the band started drifting, you know, in, in consciousness, he, he put his elbow on the keyboard. <laughs> doesn't matter where, or two elbows on the keyboard, and just held this one completely dissonant note for like a minute or whatever basically until everybody woken up like oh my god and and recalibrated and really were back in okay we're playing in the present moment and he also said there was um saxophonist in the 60s who he uh he said you know i pay you to i don't pay you to rehearse in your hotel room he'd you know if you do that again he'd heard the guy practice in his uh, hotel room he said if he do it again you're sacked you know you play on the bandstand because he didn't want people to rehearse licks beforehand and then they go on stage you know you you was your mind thinking oh where can i put in this nice lick that i practiced last night in the hotel room or yet this morning in the hotel room and miles didn't want that he wanted people on stage to be right there it's a bit like in zen you know totally in the present moment i mean another little example and stop me when i go too long but there was a there's an anecdote was told by uh, one of his band members who was sitting i think it was m2 may in 1970 and Gary Bartz, who was a saxophonist in the band at the time, it was a break between two sets. And he comes in and says, Miles, you know, you got to do something here. This Keith Jarrett guy, you know, who's on keyboards, he's playing all the time. It drives me nuts. I have no <laughs> freedom. I cannot go anywhere. He's playing all the time when I'm playing solo. Can you please time to tell him to lay out when I solo? So Miles said, yeah, I'll take care of it. So he says to someone, you go and get Keith Jarrett. So Gary Bartz leaves. Keith Jarrett comes in and Miles says to him, you know, you know, Keith, Gary Bartz was just here. You know, I'm going to tell you something, you know, Gary says, what you do behind him when you play solo, he says, it's fantastic. Please play more. Do everything you can to play the maximum possible because Gary loves it. So, <laughs> so they went out for the second set. And at the end of the second set, they, they almost literally, it came to blows between Keith Jarrett and Gary Bartz. <laughs> <laughs> But Miles, he enjoyed that tension. I mean, it's a bit probably what you today would call trolling going on, just seeing, yeah. you know, winding people <laughs> up and seeing how you can get them. But there was also a musical thing yeah. where he wanted people to get out of their comfort zone. Yeah. And it was all live, you know, today in this day of DA, of doors, you know, where, can, where everything is perfect and you can move things perfectly in time and perfectly in, in tune and, and we, can, we can polish these things, these tracks forever. But I think there's a lot to be learned that actually, you know, perfection does not necessarily mean better. And the spontaneity and the feeling, and that's why this music still translates today, you know. So that was, yeah. and I'm still very, as a musician in my thinking, very influenced by uh, Miles Davis and by what all these musicians told me at the time. That's beautiful. I mean, talk about inspirational. Being able mm -hmm. to hear firsthand stories from all of these musicians, that's really quite incredible. So 
you spent two and a half years writing this book, and yep. I mean, it must have been quite exhausting as well. Like emotionally, you're so invested in it. Did you? It it was very. It was yeah. Towards the end, it really got a bit crazy. I mean, yeah. it really ended up you know sixteen hour days every day. Uh, wow. You know, and then in, you lie in your bed at night because also there's an enormous amount of material. I talked to 50 musicians. So, wow. yeah, the last half year, really, I, I just completely just, you know, <laughs> yeah. it, it took me after that for about a year. I didn't do much work. Uh, but actually, straight after I finished the book, literally months after it got published, I met my wife. And then that was a whole new adventure as we, you know, got to know each other. And then a while later, my first kid was born. So I, I spent a few years just doing that, you know, just, just being, uh, uh, you know, we didn't get married straight away, but like domestic life, you know, yeah. being in, with a woman and, and having kids and, and, and being with a baby, which I have to say, again, was a matter of endless sleepless nights. So oh, the yes. sleep bit, the sleep I have bit two. Was... I have two kids, so I know. <laughs> Anybody who doesn't have kids watching this, just beware. It's wonderful. But yeah. you get initiated in what I call the greatest secret conspiracy in the world. <laughs> Nobody understands it unless you actually have a kid. No. You can explain it to people and they won't know because I, I heard all the same stories. Over. Their yeah. eyes glaze over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, they, they don't understand half a year of sleeping two hours a night. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But it's wonderful. And as I said, the, the two boys are now 14 and 11. There is a video, I think... Uh, you know, of the two-year-old imitating Jimmy Page with a was a was a ping pong bat, which is hilariously funny that I uploaded to my channel. Nice. And they got their first single out, so uh, you know they're doing pretty good. Yeah, fantastic. Well, we'll put a link to the song so people can go mm -hmm. and check it out as well. Yep. So um, let's sort of fast track a little bit then and and talk about this song. Now, stay with me. It was obviously a massive worldwide smash. Ended up with a little controversy over the melody having similarities, obviously, to a Tom Petty song. Um, they figured that out eventually. Um, but Sam Smith is probably, I know, arguably one of the great singers of the last 20 years. You know, yeah. when he was on the Grammys a couple of years ago, I think he was only one of two singers that actually sang live. I'm sure everybody will troll me and tell me I'm wrong. But... You know, I've seen him live. He's absolutely incredible. Um, mm -hmm. And the song with this mixed breakdown is, like you were pointing out earlier off camera, it's fairly simple. It's not, it's not 256 maxed out tracks, but there was a lot of a process in it. And it's interesting. And, and I often say, and you'll understand this analogy, I often say good production, good anything, but production in particular, is like dressing like a hipster. What I mean by that is when you see those really cool kids dressed really, really well, you know, but they've got this kind of really cool T-shirt on and this great haircut and this great face shirt, you know they've spent a long time making it look like they barely did anything. They just accidentally happened to look amazing. And I feel like, look, you know, looking at that song and looking at the breakdown and reading all the backstory, I think that's what they did, is they, they spent a long time trying ideas and going, nope, no, no, yes, no, no, no. And then they ended up with something which obviously was a huge hit because it sounds so natural. Absolutely, but I think the, the, the you know a lot of the credit there you know goes to the the, the main guy, the producer uh, Steve Fitzmorris, you know, uh, an English um, engineer, producer, and mixer. Uh, Work with many, I believe, many big people. I believe he's Irish, isn't he? Is he? Yes, originally he's from Ireland. You're quite yep. right. Thank you yep. for that. And he uh, very graciously, I think it was one of the only interviews he ever did, and we talked for a long time, and he sent me all the screenshots and explained to me what happened. I think really a lot of the credit goes to him. I mean. <clears throat> the story is that Sam Smith and a, two, a couple of other guys had written this kind of one fifty minute, you know, one minute fifty long demo that had no that needed to be longer, and they were stuck with it. And everybody realized it was good. So uh, Steve came in, and then under his guidance, inspiration, they wrote an extra bit to it, and then they performed it. And he and he was going. I don't know whether he was going on holiday or what he was doing, but he was off to India. And they asked him to do a very, very quick mix. So the because Sam Smith was not known at the time, so the you know people around him wanted to present it to record companies and when they went to New York. 
So we did a very quick rough mix of just this kind of uh, thing that they did with musicians who weren't that experienced. And that kind of became, it was a most, one of the most serious cases of what they call demoitis that you, that you could ever see where, you know, the, nobody can better the demo. And I think to people's credit, uh, and also his credit, but also the label and the management, everybody realized that the original de demo recording actually was better. They tried to re-record and redo. And I think, I think, I mean, for me, that I, I often relate these things, and I think to Miles, because he knew so much about music, but it relates to, you know, the, the, it's the, all the bells and whistles in the end, they mean nothing or perfect prediction, unless the song is good, of course, but also the feeling is there. Yeah. And a lot of it was about the feeling, and apparently there was a little loop that was actually wrong. You know, being in today's world, of course, Fitzmaurice, they, he, was, he was, you know, chopping the loop up and making it sound perfect in time, and he realized it actually sounded, it took the feeling away. So I think for me, it's really like if, you, if you're working on a track and, 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 and you know, you know, you have to really always trust your feeling, and, then, and they had the advantage of going away and coming back to it. Uh, but in the end, they, they did one session where they, they re-recorded it and they used just a few things of that. But according to Fitzmaurice, eighty percent of the track is from that first demo thing. Wow. Actually, it's a parallel. We, another track we did talk about was Adele, uh, Rolling in the Deep, you know, where actually uh, Paul Epworth uh, was saying that, you know, that was a demo vocal. Because just as they recorded the vocal, she just went through some stuff that related to the song. <clears throat> and whatever they did, they couldn't better it. Mm -hmm. So there's always this thing of, and I, I hear that a lot, you know, that... that um, Someone like you is the demo, is the demo, the whole thing. It is, Gano yeah, so, is yeah, and I think, um, I'm just trying to remember who it was, somebody I talked recently where, you know, whole vocal was done like on an SM7 or something, or SM, SM57, I can't remember, just a dynamic microphone, um, and they just didn't sound particularly great, but in the track it was great. So I think it's all these, you know, all these tools and techniques that, that also you, that I write about and you also in your Produce Like a Pro channel, you know, endless things you can learn. And yes, we have to learn all these things. But at the same time, always go back to, to your feeling and to basics, which is the song. And how does it make you feel? And does it work? And often the imperfections are what make, what give it the character. So I think to, to fit more as credit and everybody around them, they, they decided, yeah, no, it's actually, you know, all these retakes and re-recordings they did, did didn't improve it. I think that's really admirable to restrain yourself and not use all the tools you have at your disposal and not go and fix everything in the mix or in whatever session and just know when to stop, you know? Yeah. Dave Jordan always used to say to me, he's like, anybody can lean into a console and turning a knob. It's just like it's knowing when to not turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds you of an anecdote that, uh, that's true, but what, that, who, somebody told me this, one of the big guys, they said that you know, if they had an A&R man in the studio, in the, this was in the 80s, 90s, who, who really was being obnoxious and all the time commenting, they would give him a couple of channels on the desk, you know, and then they would, they would not be connected to anything. Yeah. <laughs> but to give the guy the illusion that he could... <laughs> the A&R &R, yeah. fader, yeah. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I know that one. <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. Yeah, the A&R fader. Or you, yeah, they would do these things where they're like, you know, I think the vocal needs to be a little hotter in the second verse, and then they pretend to turn it up, but they don't turn it up. And then the A&R guy goes, oh, yeah, that's better. It's like, okay. <laughs> it, I think it's also a sign of insecurity. Yes. You know, this endless fiddling, <clears throat> and then you, you, uh, you know, it's not going to be the, the, the half decibel of course, there are major mix mistakes, you know, but if your mix otherwise is good, the song is good, you know, the half decibel in the chorus is not going to be the difference between, the, between it being a hit or not a hit. You know, right. people really get today, uh, and also because we can, and also, you know, in the old days, it would, you know, you pay, what would it be, a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars a day in a big studio? I mean, you, you would not, you couldn't spend, uh, unless you were Michael Jackson or whoever, but you could, normal mortals would not be able to spend like, five days tweaking a mix. You do your mix, it's finished, and you live with whatever imperfections are there. Today, we it doesn't cost to spend weeks in your door yep. mucking around, which is good, but it's easy to lose sight of what you're actually really trying to achieve. I was talking to Howie Weinberg earlier today, and he told me um, he did half of Hysteria, I think. He, what, what, what Def Leppard record was it? I can't remember if it was his, but anyway, he did half of one of, half he mastered one half of the album and Bob Ludwig mastered the other half. And he was talking to the engineers. The engineers would come in and hang out with him. 
And they said there were songs on the album which were mixed over 30 days. A song. Over wow. 30 <laughs> days. But Mutt, they say Mutt would mix the song and then just decide the reason why it wasn't working was because the guitar had to be recut. And he'd come in, they'd recut the guitar. You know, it's interesting because I think there's all different kinds of approaches. I mean, there's, there's the keep working on it until it works, or there's go back and find out why it used to work and why it doesn't work. I mean, it's all the same thing. You, um, it's funny because one of the quotes that I use often is actually a Steve Fitzmaurice quote. I, in about, I think it was 99, I went back to England and I saw a friend of mine and he was working uh, with Steve on a Depeche Mode record. I think it was 99 or 2000. They were at Olympic when Olympic was still there. And I go upstairs and he's mixing actually, um, not on a Neve like he's talking about in this article, but on an Amec 1998. I don't know if you know that room at Olympic, if you remember that room. And I remember I looked over and I saw this big bank of um, Pro Tools 888s, which was the black, I don't know if you remember those, the black IOs, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And in those days, I'd been living in America about four or five years making records. And so I said to Steve, I was like, oh, wow, you, you have the 888s. And he's like, uh-huh. And I was like, well, you know, I'm living in Los Angeles and everybody just tells me that they aren't good and you have to have the Apogees and blah, 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 blah. And, and he's like, uh-huh. He goes, well, that's the difference between England and America. And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, well, he goes, in America, they do it right. In England, we just do it so it sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there is, a, there is, I mean, you know, horses for courses. I mean, there are many, many ways to get to where you want to be. Yeah. And I mean, you just mentioned Mutt Langer. I mean, I, I, I interviewed Rich Costi about the, the, the latest news record, which was produced by Mutt Langer. And Rich was telling me that that he would get mix uh, that after they recorded everything, Mutt Lange and his his guy over in Switzerland, they would literally spend like three weeks per song, moving everything in time, and cutting everything up. So he would he would get his the the, the sessions to mix, and the actually literally the, the clips they would be black, from all the edits. It was impossible to see anything, and and now Mutt Lange, I mean, and, and Rich also you know was not saying anything bad about Mutt Langer, but just saying like, you know, he did say he worked with Mutt and his Mutt was amazing in the sense that if he made even the tiniest change in the track, four days later, Mutt would hear it, you know, even if he didn't tell him. So he had a, his amazing, amazing awareness. Maybe some people can do it. But in, in this case, actually, the band, after two tracks, they decided to just go back to their original uh, you know, recordings and mix from that because also they couldn't practically wait but it's basically, you know, you can get totally lost, or so time-wise, feeling-wise, uh, endless edits, and uh, yeah, to get back to Sam Smith, uh, that the feeling of that song, mm -hmm. you know, and the, the voice, it's so powerful. Yep. And also the simplicity of the arrangements, and the way that um, Fitzmaurice presents that, you know, keeps it very simple. And this, I didn't actually do a track count, but you can see it on the on the um, on the screenshots, I think, which will be um, which will be on your website. Um, it's very, um, it's a very, very simple track, you know, and it, and that's, I mean, you just mentioned Adal is someone like you, it's like, that's like piano vocal, piano vocal, four yeah. track mix. I mean, a Tom Elmhurst mix it pulled out to, to the vocal bits in the middle to treat them differently. That was it. So the, the mic, the mic she sang on was just in the other room in there. <laughs> yeah, you've got some, uh, some serious music history there. <laughs> yeah. The, it's sitting but in the other really, room. Yeah. I think in general, you know, it's it's really a matter of staying really f in basics. And then you were asking me about a mix I did of the song that my that my boys have out. That really came together really easily. But it was also a matter of like I kept it very simple. It was the first thing, and the track was quite simple, and it came out. And now the second song, I'm really struggling because I realize I'm actually at the moment thinking, no, I'm I'm going to take back, I'm going to scrap the session, I'm going to go back to the original session because it's so easy to overcook things. Yeah. I mean, if you're actually a cook, I mean, I happen to be the cook here in the house, but you know, you, you have this <laughs> point where it's all really, really good. And then you add one more thing and you suddenly say, oh, oh, oh that's going down there. Or you leave it too long. You know, I find mixing is a bit like, I mean, the analogy is often made, but it's a bit like cooking. You, you throw these things together and you make them taste good. 
but it's it's so easy to overcook things today and also endless plugins and the sound can degrade uh, so yeah no for me this is a song as a study in simplicity and and being really focused on what what matters yeah i'm i'm talking to howard willing uh, last year and he said that uh, you know get stuff to mix all the time and he said the first thing he always does is open up the session and re remove the plugins and he says a lot of the time he just takes off a lot of the work, then goes back and does very minor stuff, sends them back like a first mix, and they're all like, wow, it's so much better. What did you do? And he's like, hardly anything. You know, <laughs> it's, it, it's, and I think that um, I, this is, and you, you, you were, one thing that um, Steve Fitzmaurice was touching on, because he ends up talking about loving working on a console. Now, he said it wasn't so much about, you know, having all the EQ and compressors on the channel strips. It was just more of the tactile idea of moving faders and not looking at a screen. And I, there was a great quote in, in, the, in your article where he said that at some point he's turning something up and it sounds just right, perfect where he wants it to be. And he looks down and he's pushed it 5 dB louder, which is an enormous amount. And he said that if he was looking at a screen, he never would turn something up that much. So when you're looking at it, it's like, oh, I'm turning it up too much. But if he's just using his ears, he turns it up until it sounds right. A right lot now. of professionals, I think, particularly the older ones who, are, who have worked uh, before the doors came in, you know, they know the whole universe of actually you only have your ears to go by. And even when you think about timing, and today you can look at it and do this, do this training line up and all that kind of stuff. And they, and I think we really, uh, anybody who, who has only worked with doors, really, it's a good thing to, to sometimes just not, not look at the screen, you know, and just use your ears and maybe also close your eyes or put the, some people put the screen to the side. I mean, it's actually difficult. I mean, I, I, I can't move away from my screen easily just because of my setup here. But sure. in the end, it's music. It's about the, you know, it's it's about what you hear. A lot of people talk about that. I mean, Stephen Fitzmaurice talks about it. He talks about another thing as well that in the old days, the mixing desks they created their own acoustics. Like I think they you do. have to your left there, uh, the reflections from the desk. So they have to also relearn how things sound without the reflections. Uh, there's of course a tactile thing when you when you do something with your hands on a you know on a desk and you can do two things at the same time. Having said that, I don't know what Fitzmaurice does today. The interview is from 1914. It's very possible that maybe today he's moved further into the, into the, you know, over to working in the box. One major, major um, thing is, and I was talking to Mark Needham last night, you know, and he's also gone to, he's a guy who's from the 70s, who also has gone totally in the box because of the requirements as a mixer today, instant recall. Just that thing that, you know, you get a phone call and say, hey, uh, gosh, we need that vocal a bit louder, that guitar a bit softer, and if you're on the door, it takes you... You know, you load up the session and it takes you 10 seconds and buff, save. In total, you're probably spending 20 minutes. And, you know, in the old days, you that would take like a, could take a whole day. Now, Steve Fitzmaurice, in that article, describes his compromise, which is he works with stems. Yeah. A lot of mix. I know Manny Marroquin, uh, and he is like, you know, one of the world's, together with Serb and January, you know, the two world top mixes in pop music. Um, Jet St Serban sadly won't do interviews, but Manny is quite happy to talk, and he still works on a desk, Manny, and it's the same thing, uh, but it's less and less and less, you know, they, they already group things in Pro Tools, only send out, like, maybe they have, like, two channels of drums on the desk and two channels of bass, very simple, you don't lay out 80 tracks over the desk anymore, and then he prints stems, uh, you know, so that's all the tracks, but mixed already, you know, with all the effects on them. And so he can then fairly easily go back and just open up his Pro Tools sessions and, and just push something up. Uh, but it has gone through the desk and he still has the experience of the, the tactileness of the mix. And they, they love the process. Steve Smore talks about liking the process, Yep. sitting in front of a desk. Um, Dave Pensado used to say, if I sit in front of a desk, you know, I feel like a million dollars. You know, if I sit in front of a, a door, I feel like a technician. You know, uh, that was... 10 years ago, he was at the start of the uh, Secrets of the Mix Engineer series. It was his idea. Dave Pensado says, I want to know what my colleagues are doing. And then, right. of course, now in his Pensado's place, he, he knows himself. But um, 
Yasim himself, but he, the, the whole series came out of that, just really asking people in great detail. And I think in the written medium and being able to see the screenshots and being able to think about it. I know some professionals who, t you know, several professionals, Fraser T. Smith, one of them. Yeah. He, I think he worked with Adele. He said every month he takes my article and looks at it. And if it's, you know, of particular interest to him, he, re he will rebuild it to some degree just to see what his colleagues are up to. Well, I'm glad that we started talking about Steve Fritz Morris because in my humble estimation, Steve could be, I think between him and like Spike Stent, you know, and I'm not dismissing other guys, but Mark Ender, I'm a huge fan of. I don't know if you've done anything mm -hmm. with Mark. Yeah, I've, I've interviewed him as well, yeah. Yeah, they've all, I've worked with all of those guys on projects. I've worked, you know, I've been blessed to work with Brower and Andy Wallace and Chris and Tom and... Um, Serban and Manny, um, but there's something special about Spike, and I, you've probably had a chance to talk to these guys in even greater depth, but the thing about Spike is he finds a way of just screwing it up. Like, he, he can just take a mix and just do something you would never expect. He's, he's, the, uh, he's the wild card, and it will come back. I had Mark Ender mix a record, and it was phenomenal. And I, and I was just blown away. And then we had a new president come into the label who was a fan of Spike's and said, you know what, let's just take the two singles and have Spike mix them. And me, uh, the producer and the A&R guy going, why? Mark Ender, he's incredible. And I went to Chalice when he was mixing at Chalice. It was probably about six, seven years ago. And I go in, and I sit down in front of the SSL and... He hits the space bar, and I just hear this mix, and I turn around to him, and I'm like, I've never heard a first mix in my life be that good. I have no idea what I could tell you to make this better. You know, it's just like that, because he just did, like, took everything that was great about the original, and then just made it even more exciting, and just twisted yeah. things, and, 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 you know, there's just some, some magic in there, just, you know, and that's... I love what he did with Muse. I love him. He's worked with Beyonce, whatever. And Steve Fitzmorris to me um, is one of those guys, one of those, I don't know how to explain it. I mean, you're, you're touching on his brilliance from the production side. He, and Spike's now moving into doing a lot more production as well, isn't it? I think that these guys are just very, very gifted on multiple levels. And they're willing, as you're pointing out, to just throw it all up against the wall and go back to something else or you know they're not um, resting on their laurels they're not tying themselves in knots they're they're, they're going where the music takes them yeah and, and I've also heard I mean I, I've done now 140 of these inside tracks or series and I, I would say probably half a dozen of them have said have said that sometimes they do a mix and after three or four hours or maybe even a day they say ah no and they start again from scratch. Like just to say that, just, just not be afraid to reinvent yourself if necessary. You know, if it's somehow, this is just not right, you know, and then they... That's great. Rather than keep endlessly, and it's a bit like with that, also that track, you know, the Sam Smith track, they, 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 they could have endlessly tinkered with it, but in the end they said, okay, now we have to go back to something where we were before. And I, and I kind of, I think that's really admirable, you know, to say, well, no, actually the direction I've taken it and I, of course you can, you can, you can keep fixing it, but just, just go back to scratch and, uh, and start again. And that clean slate, uh, for any creative person, uh, you know, I think in any, you know, I'm sure there are painters who will sometimes just, okay, just chuck this painting and start again on the white canvas or, or that, that capacity to really you know, get the slate screen. I, I have once or twice had to do it with an article. Just, ah, no, this is, you know, this is not, not right. Just start again, you know. Right. Just, I think it's really good. Yeah, it's amazing. Not enjoyable as you're in the middle of it, because it's frustrating. You know, it's really like you're using time, but I think, it, again, you know, if you want it to be good, that's you've got to do what's necessary. Yeah, what's, you'll remember the specifics, as I'm sure. What was the, what was the U2 song, the Eno wanted to erase wasn't it uh, was it streets of own name or something like that it was a big song like a big big song and he wanted to erase it 
Oh, because I don't remember that. I actually don't know that that, but I do know that that people often themselves don't know. Uh, I mean, and others, you know, you remember the Gautier song, some somebody that I used to know. Yep. Uh, Gautier himself, Wally himself, really had problems with that one and didn't really want to do it. And it was his producer, Francois Titas, who kept fighting for the song and kept fighting for the song, and they just couldn't get it right, and 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 everybody wanted to abandon it. And you know, and then so so, yeah. So there's also something about sticking with it or being having mm -hmm. faith when you know something is good. You know, uh, everything just confirms that there, that any rule is there to be broken. Some people say, well, if you if you if you if you endlessly have to redo it, probably was no good to begin with. Right. Well, that but it's not again. It's not a rule, but hey, it's a creative. You know, it's a creative industry. It's a creative thing. So you never know. Yeah, absolutely. And what's what? See, what I love is I love acquired knowledge. I love the fact that we can do, we can work on our craft, and we can build a massive skill set, and then bring that to every situation. But then I'm always constantly reminded that some of the greatest music that was ever made was made by guys like 16, 17, 18, 19 years old. You know, and that we. I think of bands like Free, like I grew up loving Free, or uh, and Andy Fraser, I believe, was 15 when they got signed. And when Paul Kossoff died, he was just turning 25, and he'd already had that career. And yet, you know, Joe Bonamossa, the, sort of the big blues rock guitar player now, I mean, you can see him interviewed, you may have interviewed him yourself, and he worships Kossoff. So his like, whole career as a 50-year-old guy is based around what a guy was doing at like 19, 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, and that incredible feel and just, it's, so it's interesting, it's one of those balances, isn't it? Because we have to remember that, uh, at least for me, it's like I'm, I'm a professional and I know what all this does and that piece of equipment and this, that and the other, and, and I understand what frequency to boost and cut and whatever, but then I have to remember, there's, there might be a 17 year old kid walk in this room in a minute and just pick up a guitar and play something and I'm just like, I never would have thought of that. You know? No, absolutely. I mean, but again, you know, we don't know. I mean, of course, um, the free, I think they were exceptional. I mean, they really were exceptional in terms of the, their youth and, uh, and, and the way that they fitted together as a unit and, and, the, and the simplicity. And I think, again, I, I just like that. Maybe it's my Zen background, you know, like with, with, it was the Sam Smith song and, and, you know, keep it simple. But, you know, sometimes you have production where they throw the kitchen sink and you think, ah, it's great, right. you know. Uh, it just again that there are no rules, but it's true. You, you know, um, the youth of today. I mean, my kids, for example. But there are many of them, many people around. Um, and it's, I think EDM at the moment. I mean, um, Zed is twenty-seven. I mean, he started like around twenty. I think Skrillex started very young. There, there are quite a few people in that direction. Uh, Justin Bieber, another one. I mean, you can think of what you like. And you know, some people think, oh, Justin Bieber, this or that. But actually. In all honesty, and, and we're planning to do, I think, one presentation, one about his tracks, I think that yep. he, uh, and, and how far it's him or how far others, we never know, but I mean, he has a, a mixer, producer, a and guy called Josh Goodwin. And actually, I think his album uh, sounds great, you know, the the, uh, the Purpose one, and there's a lot of space in these songs, and I can't, it's not for me to listen to the whole thing, but I think if I listen, it actually, it actually sounds really great, and some of the songs, uh, you know, particularly the the big hits. What do you mean? And and love yourself. Actually, really, really great things. You know, and so done by somebody very young, uh, with a team around him. But still, you know, it's there's stuff being made also today that that's very worthwhile. Yeah, I agree. I mean, hey, the Beatles were the first boy band. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. Yes. With identical suits and the same haircut. I mean. I'm not, I'm not trying to minimize it, but, you know, people start in their careers. I mean, any of these young artists we're talking about, who knows, in 20 years' time, I mean, if they keep growing and developing. It could, know, be it's, it's, it could be one you year time. could be one exactly. You, exactly. Get these, you get this sudden buff, you know, and suddenly somebody is there and you think, wow, did that come from, you know? Yeah. And, uh, like, was it Megan Trainer? Was, uh, was that song? All, All about, about the, the bass, bass. yeah. Yeah, and then she she had she did a performance of that live, and it was obvious that she actually totally doesn't didn't yet have the the musical skills to stand on stage in front of a big audience. But you know, all, all kudos to her, and she obviously would be growing in that. But that was also like suddenly buff, you know, sixteen, and then at seventeen she wasn't there or whatever age she was. But I think she was a teenager. Right. 
when that suddenly got really big and blew up and, and so on. So well, we should we should get you to do uh, a mix breakdown of your son's track. Okay, um, we'll I like do. to see inside of your mind and see how you think. Mm -hmm. And I love that because you know a real a real time kind of breakdown, explaining the decisions and stuff like that. It helps. It helps me. I love watching those kind of videos because I get to go. Oh, okay, he did that. I would have done that because of this. All, oh, but it's it's like you were talking about with Fraser. You know, and and I know Fraser as well. And he's he's a very humble, very talented guy with, you know, zero ego. And I, it's, he would be the first person I would imagine would have said that, that to you, that he goes out of his way to read articles, to find out what people did, because he's, he's uh, humble enough to want to be learning. Yeah, it's this thing, and I talk about it with my kids, you know, because um, they, they're, you know, they, they being their age, just like, oh, hey, look at what I did. And I keep saying to them, yeah, that's great. But, you know, there's a big difference between being in performance mode or being in learning mode, mm -hmm. you know. And when you're in performance mode, you can't learn. Yeah. So to have that sense of, okay, uh, you know, always, I mean, in Zen, they talk about beginner's mind, you know. And it doesn't mean that, that you know, people have been practicing Zen for, for 50 years. They're not beginners. Mm -hmm. But the capacity, always go back to beginner's mind, to always go back and say, listen, I can learn something new. Yeah. Uh, I think when that stops, you, you kind of, you stop growing mm -hmm. and you, you, stop, you stop being alive to me. You always yeah. have to go back to beginner's mind. And I think that's where these things are great, you know, that, that also now is YouTube is such a resource of where you can go and learn, you know, and you pick up new inspiration, new things, and just saying that everybody, most people have something that you can learn from. And then, yeah, okay, then of course, you put it in something and you believe in what you do. But that, that, that difference between, you know, performance mode and learning mode, I think is so crucial. I worked with, uh, recently interviewed and uh, did some filming with Brent Fisher. And Brent is this incredible composer, horn arranger, string arranger, an incredible bass player. And we went in for a couple of days to NRG and saw him tracking and, you know, working with incredible players. And I interviewed him after we finished tracking and, you know, asked him about the experience. And he goes, every day is a good day when I'm learning. Yeah. yeah. This, is, this yeah. is a guy who's won Grammys, you know. And for, for horn arrangements, and he, he still was, oh, I'm learning. It, just, it was just so refreshing. Well, yeah. it's also what I do with my articles, you know, because, of course, uh, you know, having done 140 of them, or I don't know how many. I also do them for an Australian magazine separately and sometimes for a Japanese magazine that they commission. So I, so I suppose I've done maybe 200 over the last uh, 10 years. Well, there are days you go, oh, okay, here we go again. You know, like <laughs> there, are, there are days like everybody has when you have a job and you do it. But then it's always like, okay, stop, and actually, and just remind myself, like, okay, you know, everybody, everybody has a unique perspective, and it's my job to find out what that unique perspective is, you know? And the moment I, I remind myself, oh yeah, buff, okay, you know? And then it's a completely different ball game, and I'm sitting there just listening to the guy talk. It's usually a guy. Hey, girls, where are you? You know, there's so few, <laughs> I've, had two, I've done two women in this, in this 10 years. It'd be great to see more women um, do this kind of work. But, you know, you listen to the person talk and what their passion is. And, of course, everybody who's reached that level, they're passionate about it. They wouldn't be where they are if they wouldn't. So they will have things yeah. that are, they, every single one of them will have something you think, ah, oh, I never thought of that. Yep. And that's, <clears throat> that's what I try to find out. And every time, of course, all the inside tracks, they follow, they go to what they did on the drums, and so often it's the same plugins, and they go to what they did on the bass and the vocals and the keyboards. And that very technical bit actually is is maybe less, you need to know your technical bits, but it may be less interesting just because why do they do it? And what are they trying to achieve? And what is their vision? And what yeah. is their thought process? That's really where for me the meat is uh, I agree. in I these agree. articles. I, I talk about that a lot. I, I say to people, I was like, you know, it seems like every time I open up YouTube, there's another new audio channel out. It's like, probably 50 a day and I'm like it's because you only have to watch like five mixing chat um, you know uh, five mixing videos on how to mix drums and you just write down the frequencies to boost and cut and then you can go and make your own video you know of how to boost and cut and EQ and compress um, you know drums but Everybody hears things differently. So you sit there and you build this set of instruments together and, and the way you blend them, the way they interact together, 
is different for everybody and why they choose to do that. And I always try, as you're talking about here, to look past the technical. Because the, the reality is, is like having the technical skills will get you from like here to here. But to get over the finish line and create something great is so much more. So much more. And one like guys like Andy Wallace, like Andy mixed an album for me years ago. And I had I had stereo pan guitars doing really cool things with heavies underneath and like a key part and bass and drums and background vocals and the lead vocal. The record came back, one guitar, one guitar, bass, a lead part, a vocal. You know, the harmonies went, didn't need the harmonies. Uh, the two extra guitar frilly parts that I had, he just muted them. I think he may have brought them in at the very last chorus for a little bit of a change. And I was just like, what's he done with my guitar? And then I sat and listened to it and went, oh, it sounds so much better. It's so much cleaner and to the point. And I was adding lots of harmonies underneath the vocal to reinforce the vocal, to push the vocal out in front of all the extra guitars I did. And yeah, it's amazing, so you, you had, know what I mean? It's slightly <laughs> overcooked it. Yeah, I totally overcooked it. So he went mute, but, mute, 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 and suddenly the vocal's beautiful. And it's and like, also, it, it goes back again to the Sam Smith thing, you know, yeah. about simplicity, economy of means. Mm -hmm. I, I'm attracted, I, I said, even as I like the kitchen sink sometimes, I like big productions, actually. <clears throat> in all honesty, I like big productions. Sure. Uh, but well, you it like always Prague. has to be in the service. Huh? You like prog. Yes, exactly. So I like I like all the ear candy and listen a bit of this, listen a bit of that, and several things at the same time. My, my ear, my mind, I like complexity. I wouldn't have written a 300,000 word book if I didn't like yeah. complexity. No, I, I hear you. But, I, yeah, that makes perfect sense. But it's sense. really, when you, work, yeah, when you work with music, go back to basics mm -hmm. and go back to really, uh, you know, always keep going back to what it is you, you really need to do, what it really is about. And... Um, and I did have the pleasure or the honor of watching if some of these guys work like in studio surroundings, you know, and really, and that, that what you get from that is a kind of attitude, the, the focus, the attitude, you know, the, the, that really is what it's all about, you know, the cho the creative choices. You know, in the old days, there were like several hundred big studios around the world where you could go and be a tape op or a station engineer and learn from the guys. That avenue is virtually closed now because it's almost... So we have to find it other ways. It's a focus and the attitude and then the choices that you make. And then all the technology, they use your tools. You know, it's like if you're, if you're a carpenter, you're not all the time focused on your hammer and your chisel and this and that. You're focused on the cabinet you're trying to make and you have a vision yeah. for a certain cabinet. And then you need to know your skills. But it's the cabinet... You know, you might have the most perfect tool to the cabinet. If the proportions are wrong, people will go say, what do you do there? That doesn't, <laughs> that looks terrible. <laughs> and it's the same thing with music. So, um, yeah. Well, thank you ever so much for your time. This is going to be a lot of fun. This yeah. is going to be a lot of fun. Well, obviously, the link to download the, um, the PDFs, the track listing, everything is going to be floating around here somewhere. Um, okay. And uh, we'll come back to you. I want to see this mix breakdown. I will do. I think that'll be a lot of fun. <clears throat> yep. And you uh, can see also more of these inside tracks, by the way, or the the ones I do for Australia and Japan. They are on my own website, tingan.org. Cool. Well, that so we'll have I, your so website you link is down here as well. Link to the book. Yep. Yep. We'll have website it. Website about to be updated. It looks terribly like old style. That's because I did it myself 15 years ago. But it's about to go into some kind of word process, uh, word, uh, WordPress thing. Great. Well, thank you ever so much, my friend. Thank uh, you. I'm looking at, I hope everybody had a marvelous time, and uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. All right. Sleep well, Warren. Thanks, mate. <laughs>